Betsy Butterick, welcome to the Wave Champions podcast. So glad to have Thank you here. Thank you. It's yeah. great to be here, John. Jerry, thanks. I appreciate it. Well, yeah. we're we're thrilled to have you. Um, you come highly recommended from uh, Nadine uh, Dabina at the USOPC. And uh, she said, oh, you have to have Betsy on your podcast. And so we reached out. And thankfully, before the holidays here, we had some time in our schedules. Um, so it, it's awesome. And I want to make the most use of our time. And I just want to dive right in. And, and like I, when I go to your website, it says what you do is you improve communication effectiveness while strengthening relationships and working collaboratively to create positive change. Like, what is that? And why does that matter? Yeah, um, it's a made up job, John. And I'll, I'll be completely <laughs> transparent in that, I, you know, my background is in athletics. I grew up playing all sports. Soccer was my first love starting at age three. And, and I went from being a student athlete to then falling into coaching. And I, I happened to, I grew up in the Bay Area from the time I was 11. And I went to Stanford women's basketball camp as a camper. And that was my dream school. I was like, gosh, if I can just get admitted, maybe I can try out as a walk-on and I can achieve this dream. Nobody else in my family played basketball. So I really didn't have a roadmap or, or much guidance. And this is what you need to do to get you know a college scholarship. And I didn't get into Stanford and I got the rejection letter and I taped it above my bed as motivation to, to keep striving and get better. I went to the local junior college for a year, played basketball there, got great grades, applied again. I got a second rejection letter from Stanford. Um, this time it was a really nice note from admissions that said, you know, Elizabeth, we realize you've applied twice now and best wishes if you decide to apply a third time. And then I had to make a decision. Do I take a scholarship offer from a division one school that I had on the table, or do I try for Stanford a third time? I decided to take the offer and over my college career ended up playing junior college division one, division three. I graduated from Claremont McKenna in Southern California. And I got into coaching because I was coaching at Tara's basketball camps. So went from camper to camp coach. And then it was the summer before my, I believe my junior and senior year in college when Tara said, you know, when you graduate, would you like to come back and be the women's basketball intern? So I said, of course. So at 11, I fell in love with Stanford. At 21, I'm now part of the staff as the intern. And it would be actually when I was 31 that I came back and as a facilitator did a workshop in the position I currently occupy with Stanford women's basketball. So to see the dream realized really over 20 years, um, but it is a completely made up job. And the job came from having a background in athletics and then getting into coaching. And I loved everything about coaching. So I coached college basketball, I coached camps, I coached you know private lessons in the summers. And we were on a, a road trip when I was coaching at Occidental College. So I coached seven of the 10 years I was in collegiate basketball with Heidi Vanderveer, Tara Vanderveer's youngest sister. Fantastic human being, phenomenal basketball coach. We're on a trip in the Bay Area and our athletic director had come with us to meet with some donors and alumni in the area. So I get a voicemail after one of the games and it says, Betsy, if, if Heidi says it's okay, I want you to take the minivan, drive up here to San Francisco. There's someone I want you to meet. So I drove up to the city and it's one of those iconic, dark, rainy San Francisco nights. And I pull up to this dimly lit whiskey bar and there is my athletic director sitting at a table with another woman. And my AD said, Betsy, this is Sue. Sue coaches leaders. I think you have a lot to talk about. And that was the first moment when I became aware that coaching was something that existed outside of sport. And the joke when I was coaching basketball was always that I liked basketball. I loved people. And as soon as I found out that I could coach in a way outside of sport that really put me in an intimate environment with people, that was the thing I felt most called to do. And that was back in 2011. And I went to school for a year while coaching basketball at Oxy to get what's called my integral coaching certificate. And so that evolved into starting to coach coaches because I thought if I can help coaches be at their best and be someone who's there to support them, then they can give their best to the student athletes that they coach. And in doing so, maybe I could help elevate the quality of the student athlete experience. So coaching coaches, when I started coaching coaches, was not a thing that I could look to anyone else and say, oh, this is a great model or example of what this could be and what this could look like and the impact that it could make. But I felt like it mattered. And so I started walking this unknown path. And then 2015 was really the point where I no longer felt like I was giving my best to either. I was the assistant head coach at uh, UC San Diego, mm -hmm. and I had this cute 
studio apartment three blocks from Wind and Sea Beach in La Jolla, California. Great team, great academic institution. I loved who I worked with and I felt like I was being called in another direction. And so I, I stepped off the court in 2015 to do what I do now. The communication specialist piece, again, that's really the made up title. And it's almost a daily, you know, you talk about imposter syndrome, like those voices get really loud on some days because I don't have any formal degree or training or certification in communication other than I've been a human for 37 years. Mm -hmm. I've had a vested interest in reading and language and the power of words since as early as I can remember. And communication for me is that that thread that runs through all things, specifically when we talk about high-performing teams. And I'd like to say this, the buzzword most associated with high-performing teams is chemistry. And chemistry is formed through connection. And for me, at the heart of connection is communication. Mm -hmm. So if we can actively cultivate our communication skills, and we can, anybody can at any time, then we stand a better chance at connecting with people in a way that we know leads to our ultimate success. Mm -hmm. So it's a made up job. And thankfully, people keep showing up and telling me that it matters. So I get to do work that I love and give back to the community that I care so deeply about. I, I love it. And Jerry, I know you're going to want to jump in here and, and ask a question on that because you had some, we, we come up with some questions and we kind of throw them on paper and know that we'll never go in order. Um, and uh, I think Jerry, you want to bring up something to that. But when you're saying that, I always think of, uh, you know, my brother and I have a, a friend who's a dog trainer and he says, I don't train dogs, I train owners. And mm. um, I think sometimes, you know, Jerry and I get brought in to work with teams, right? And it's like, oh, you know, work with these teams, make them mentally tough or whatever. And I think, Jerry, we're always like, um, we get brought in to work with teams. But really, we're working with the coach because if they do the right things and create the right environment and communicate, um, then the team's going to be mentally tough. The team's going to be strong. But if you don't create that environment, if you're not on board and you just want us to fix the kids, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I, I, I feel that. And, and I think that that's the challenge of, of really doing any kind of supportive work within athletics is coaches get paid and I, and I know from being a coach, our livelihood, if you really scale it back, it's crazy, especially at the college level, that we're putting our professional career in the hands of individuals whose prefrontal cortex is not fully developed, right? So our livelihood professionally is dependent upon herding cats and, and giving our best to these individuals that are going to change and cycle through every year. And the pressure that's put on so many coaches in different ways leaves them in a space where oftentimes they're looking for that quick fix mm -hmm. or they're looking for that band-aid. They're looking for that right now tool that's going to change the way that they can be of service to their student athletes, but more specifically fix their team, right? Mm -hmm. Like you hear about the fixes all the time. And, and as you articulated, John, it's not us, it's not ours to fix individuals. Mm -hmm even just the, the wording of fixing means that something is broken. And I really mm -hmm. am intentional about coming into situations and saying, not what's broken, but what can be approved upon? Mm -hmm. like, what are we working with? And how can we take the raw material and mold it or contain a, create a more intentional container for it to grow and develop in a way that's unique to that team or program? Mm -hmm. Jerry? I wanna, I wanna jump in here for a second. Um, Betsy, uh, do you know Cindy Timshaw? No, I don't. The name is familiar, but I can't say that I. Well, that I I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a compliment from her. So, uh, so I'm sitting here doing my work one day. Cindy's the uh, head coach at Navy women's lacrosse. She was the head coach for Maryland uh, women's lacrosse, and I worked with her with Gary Gate. We were there for 12, 13 years. We won seven consecutive national championships. Wow. She's an icon. She's she's like the Tara Vanderveer of women's lacrosse, the winningest coach and, and all of that, right? So she's really the real deal. So I'm sitting here, I'm starting to get texts from her. And I'm saying, what the heck is she talking about? And uh, she said, yeah. She says, I'm at this, I'm at this, uh, pot, uh, I don't know what it was. It was summit, like a, online summit or something. Online summit, right? And yeah. uh, there's this woman here. Betsy and uh, listen to this. This is what she said. And I get back and I said, that's brilliant. And then she another comment. Oh, what, what about this? She said this, this sounds really good. I said, it's excellent. Oh, you're so lucky. I didn't yeah. even know who you were at the time. So what I did that night was uh, 
uh, I sort of looked up some information about you and John had told me that we're actually going to be here with you today. And uh, so I went on to your uh, site and I found some uh, YouTubes. Yeah, and uh, react videos, sure. Right, and OMG, like they jumped <laughs> off the page and they hit me square between the eyes. And I said, I'm gonna try this. That you had one little thing there and it was about, about communicating, uh, asking, asking the right question when you wanna listen. Now, for mm -hmm. all of our listeners out there, listening is, in my mind, and John, I think Betsy, you'll agree with this with communication, listening is perhaps one of the most important skills that a, that a coach or a person or a parent or any of us can have, right? Right. But as a coach and as a parent too, we're put in this position like we're the experts and we know all. So when people are talking with us, we're supposed to listen, but while we're listening, we're formulating these responses in our head. Right. And, and I do it all the time because it's like, oh, I got to have the answer now. I've got to come up with this thing. They're expecting it. You know, this is Jerry Lynch, the expert. You know, he's written all these books and stuff. So I went downstairs that night. And uh, with COVID, I had three of my adult children at home. And uh, I practice good listening. But I'll tell you what. I went down there and I asked the question. And I want you to elaborate on because there's no one that can do it better than you. But I asked them the magical question in terms of listening. I asked myself the magical question, right? You know what I'm talking about? I'm going to take a guess since you referenced the ACT videos. Is it the question, what can I learn? Is that would you the question? Would you that take you're... it from there? Because sure. th th this is your baby. And I'll tell you, I, I, I want to tell everyone that's listening. I had the most incredible evening with my kids. I don't know whether they noticed it, but they felt it. Yeah, and, I'm Jerry. And ah. it was amazing how that how that evolved. That's so cool. Thank you for sharing, and, and thank you for watching. The act videos are, are things that they're so much fun for me to create, and I'll I'll say that they started <laughs> in 2017, really, as um, you know, everyone tells you. Uh, so I started my own business, not knowing anything about business, which reflectively, like, not the the, the smartest thing for one to do <laughs> if you hope to be successful. But I knew that if I could do this thing, that it, that it might matter. It might make a difference. And in order to do that, I had to leave coaching basketball in the way that I was. So I took the leap. And I had just done that presentation with Stanford Women's Basketball years ago. And one of the assistants, good friends with an assistant at the time at Santa Barbara. So the Santa Barbara assistant calls. They're like, Bets, I heard you just did a great workshop with Stanford. I want to pitch you to our head coach. I said, that'd be great. Let me know what you need. She calls back about two days later and she says, you know what, Bets, I'm really sorry. She ended up going with someone that she knows. And I said, you know, that, that makes complete sense. So that became the question in my mind of how can I provide value for people while also giving them a taste of what it might be like to work with me without ever having met me. Mm -hmm. And that became the driving force behind creating these ACT videos. So ACT stands for Active Communication Technique. Mm -hmm. They're short videos, roughly two minutes or less, that are designed to give anybody Somebody, something that they can do today, some tangible thing that they can do today to improve the way that we communicate and connect with other people. So the video that you're referencing, Jerry, I believe is uh, the question great listeners ask. Yeah, and yeah, but, but wait, is, let, let me interrupt yeah. you, but you're doing yeah. this in a car. Oh yeah. Oh, you're, yeah. I mean, you're, oh yeah, you're, you're doing this. You're doing <laughs> this in driving. a- I wasn't driving. I, I noticed it was probably a Prius, right? Um, you know, gosh, I don't know. Or something I, I, like that. I think it might have been a Mazda. Um, well, well but, here you are in a car. You look like Michelle yeah. Obama, you know, when she does that drive around, you know, with, with the microphone. <laughs> or carpool stuff. karaoke, right? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, you, I had, I had about, to interrupt there. Go ahead. No, I, and I appreciate it. So, I mean, that in itself is, is the entrepreneurial journey is fascinating and it's maddening and it's beautiful and it's so deeply rewarding and, and filming the videos, um, when I was living in Austin, Texas, this was 2017, I was, it was act video day. And the first video that I filmed, I think I did like 56 takes, right? And it's, like, <laughs> and, and it's just me. And I, and I was committed from the beginning to doing it in one take. I knew I could film it and I could splice it together, but that's not the way communication happens in real time. You know, we find ourselves in conversation with someone or we're giving a talk or there's a really important moment with our team and we're live. 
So how do we respond when we're live? So I thought, you know, these need to be authentic. I want to do them in one take. And I remember I was getting ready to film a different act video, maybe the third or fourth. And I just got out of the shower and I'm in an empty apartment and I stick my head out the bathroom and I was like, makeup, where is makeup? You know, because you just, you have to humor yourselves. And I thought, gosh, one day it would be so great to have a recording studio and a production team and a video editing team because I'm wearing so many hats. And yet I value that experience so much. I still don't have those pieces, but I've gotten much better at filming in one or two takes, you know, as, but, I, as I gain skills as a communicator. Um, so yes, so, I did it in my car. But you are so much more genuine and authentic and I could relate to that. You can bring in all those other pieces in the recording right. studio and everything else, but it's still gonna feel like a recorded studio. This felt live, this felt real. Like I wanted to go down and do it right then. And that's what I did because you were in oh. a car. But anyway, I appreciate that. Go a little deeper into that that question yeah. because it's really yeah. magical. And you say it felt real, Jerry. That was the only real place I could find that was quiet enough to record a video that day. So that's why it happened <laughs> yeah. in the car. <laughs> so the listening and and I I do I agree and and echo the importance of listening. And oftentimes when we think about communication, our initial thought is the things that we say, and we think about what am I going to say? What am I going to say? And we spend so much time in each day involved in some form of communication and we tend to only be intentional when we have something important to say or we're really curious how our message is going to be received and you mentioned jerry you know i, I practice and i still do it right like people talk and i feel this pressure whether it's as a coach or simply as someone in a conversation to have the next thing to say in part because as a society especially western society most of us are very uncomfortable with silence and yet we know there's such a gift in silence. Some of the best communicators I've yeah. ever had a conversation with always pause before they respond. And I'm happy to wait because I know there's value in everything that comes out of their mouth. We tend to, and I'll, I'll back up and say most people speak at a rate of about 150 words per minute. We all have that friend that speaks very quickly, or we know someone that speaks a little more slowly. On average, about 150 words per minute. Our brains, on the other hand, have the ability to process at about a thousand words per minute. So that's a lot of extra time. And people routinely beat themselves up and say, I try, I try Betsy, but I can't stop thinking about what I wanna say while someone else is talking. And so the first thing I always offer is, well, it's not entirely your fault. Your brain's very smart. People don't speak very fast. That's a lot of extra time. The natural thing to do is to fill that time thinking about what we wanna say next. There's a few ways to counteract this. And you mentioned one of them in the act video, Jerry, which is to hold in your mind this question, what can I learn? And curiosity is one of the, the foundational pieces for me in the work that I do. I think it's an interesting dichotomy, especially as a coach, when you're in a position where you're tasked with knowing, and yet so much of the learning and development of our student athletes depends on, can we let go of what we know and pick up what's needed in this moment? Can we be responsive to what's in front of us instead of only putting forth that which we've practiced and prepared? So do we have that flexibility, not only in skill or in technique, but also in language and in connection? So holding in our mind, what can I learn? Showing up with that curiosity to every conversation, especially, and I love that you referenced your kids, especially with the people that we know well, because we've spent so much time with them, either physically or remotely or in conversation, that we often know how they're going to respond or what they're going to say. The challenge with that is that when we know we limit their ability to surprise us and to show up differently and to teach us something. We stop hearing them on some level. So there's a variety of things that I recommend for folks to try to help their ears stay a little more open. Mm -hmm. And improv games that I love to play with teams and organizations that really help us work on cultivating our ability to truly listen. Because when we listen, we have so many more options for then how we can choose to respond. Mm -hmm. um I have a what can I learn question that I think will set the table for us to go into some of these tools. Um, and I know it's a very, uh, you told me it's a popular presentation that you do. And so you call the kids these days, right? And this oh, is the, something that we hear all the time from coaches, oh, kids these days. And I always look at them and say, well, he's doing okay and she's doing okay. So is it the kids or is it you? So maybe one of the best things that our um, listeners right now could learn from you is give us the 30,000 foot overview of how 
kids these days might be a little bit different uh, because of technology and all these other things. And what are the things as a coach that we should pay attention to that so we can better connect with kids these days? Absolutely. And I appreciate you, you teeing this up. This is, I'll say, the most requested workshop that I do currently. And it's called um, Relating to Today's Student-Athlete, Effectively Coaching Gen Z. And the phrase I hear, it doesn't matter what sport, it doesn't matter what level, the phrase I hear so often from coaches starts with kids these days. And then there's usually something that's more critical than it is positive. And it's almost always followed with when I was a coach or when I was a student athlete or when I was growing up. And that I think is the biggest barrier between connecting with kids these days is judging kids these days, specifically Gen Z, based on who we were when we were being coached. It's not the same world. It's not the same thing. And, it, and it's a disservice to today's student athlete to criticize or evaluate their behavior or tendencies or way of being based off of who we were when we were their age. It's simply a different environment. We always say context matters. Context is completely different. So it's an unfair judgment on today's student athlete when we evaluate them in that way. Mm -hmm. When I do this workshop, I always start with, and I say, you know, let's quickly go around the room and I'd like you to finish this sentence. The sentence is kids these days, dot, dot, dot. And then I ask everyone in the room to finish the sentence. And I do this to really set the stage with the way that most people finish that sentence isn't inherently positive. And if we can start to take a different perspective and better understand the context of why today's student athlete is different from any previous generation, when we seek to understand, we can then more effectively connect with and coach today's student athlete. So that's kind of the, the big picture. Getting into the specifics, Gen Z, which is routinely known as individuals born roughly around 1996 or after, they've also been dubbed the iGen because they've never known life without the internet. And I think about, okay, I'm 37. And I remember when I was growing up that we had uh, one of those phones that was in the kitchen. It was the only phone we had, but it had the really, really, really long cord. And so you could stretch <laughs> it into almost every room downstairs. So that was the phone that we had. And then I your remember, mobile phone. yeah, yeah. And then we got, um, we had the computer lab at school, which was a giant box and it was that black and green. And the only thing we did on it was word processing and playing the end of the Oregon trail game, which was a great game. I love the game. It printed off sheets of paper that had the tabs you had to tear off the sides and it came in that back mm -hmm. and forth. I remember the dial-up tone of connecting to AOL, this thing called the internet, which I didn't use anything in the internet other than to chat with other people. Mm -hmm. And then when I got a pager and there was pager code and after a pager, it was a cell phone. And even car phones were still like taking that kitchen phone off the wall and just sticking it between the driver and passenger side seats. So the way that technology has evolved in my lifetime, and then I think about the fact that kids born around 1996 or after have never known life without the internet. Most of them are able to operate some technology or some form of technology like your iPad or iPhone mm -hmm. before they could speak full sentences. Mm -hmm. So we have a dramatically different student athlete than ever before because of technology. In addition, the world events that have happened as these individuals have grown up have greatly shaped their worldview in a way that's different than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So. Some stats for you here, 52% of Gen Z cites honesty as the most important quality in leadership. So Gen Z has grown up in a post 9-11 world and an era of terrorism and school shootings and global recession and climate change. So as a result of all of these, Gen Z is overwhelmingly more realistic than optimistic. Mm -hmm. And I say that they're not pessimistic. That doesn't mean that they're pessimistic. It means that they're much more realistic than previous generations. In addition, 61% of Gen Z, dis they cite some desire to have a career in social entrepreneurship. So the way that they're used to working is different. We think mm -hmm. of them as autonomous. You mm -hmm. know, it's them interfacing with a screen all the time. But that screen has allowed them to connect with people that they've never met before. So they're actually much more connected just in a very different way. One they'll say that's very easy for us to judge. So we see them as autonomous. They're highly collaborative and we can leverage that, especially as coaches, and co-create with them. Mm -hmm. And then finally, this is the really distressing one. And if you've seen, uh, what is it, the social experiment on that? Social post, dilemma. Right? Yeah, yeah. Social yeah. dilemma. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Terrifying, right? I Terrifying. Watched it and it was like, ah, my yeah. phone is evil, right? Yeah. So 
79% of Gen Z exhibit some form of emotional distress when kept from their electronic devices. Mm -hmm. Most of Gen Z will spend at least five hours per day on multiple devices. So they typically mm -hmm. multitask across five screens. Take that into a pandemic landscape where we're now doing you know, digital learning and remote learning and you've added an additional screen if not multiple hours. So there's just so many different ways that today's student athlete is not like the student athlete that we were when we were coaching. But when we can start to understand the ways that Gen Z is different, then we can start to proactively engage them in ways that make sense to them based off who they are instead of who we wish they were. Mm -hmm. And and Jerry, what's like awesome about this, you've worked with Tara at Stanford, you've worked with Cindy uh, at, at Navy and, and Maryland and, and others, is that these great coaches who have longevity, right, have have worked with kids from different eras, right? They, yeah. They've coached and, and they've adapted and they don't, um, they don't forsake their principles, right? They, they still are authentically like this. You want to be part of my program. This is what it's at, but they're very adaptable to who's in front of me. Right, Jer? Yeah, that's, that's the key word right there. Uh, you just hit the nail on the head, adaptability. And the coaches that don't adapt and the leaders that don't adapt find themselves without jobs without work, without anything meaningful. And uh, I love what uh, Betsy's saying here. And John, you're just co-telling on that as well, which is wonderful. I love I love the fact that I have the ability and, and I love the fact that we all have the ability to adapt and uh, we have to use it. It's, it's just so crucial. Uh, is, <laughs> I'm really riveted by this conversation. And, and, and the thing the thing about this, uh, this electronic age is it's a struggle for me. And uh, I, I need a lot of help with it. And, and the coaches do as well. So we're all in this together trying to help each other. And I think what's important is that we recognize that and we're aware of that. And then we do whatever we can to learn. The older folks, myself, I guess, is one of those, uh, and the older coaches, um, we're sophisticated, but not in that way. We're more sophisticated, actually, in ways that, Betsy, you're talking about, which is the communicative the relationship, the connecting, the caring. Uh, we, we have that a chance to be experts at that because we've been at it for so long. And uh, which, which I can segue into something else that I'd like to explore here is, look, the coaches, coaches have been using uh, a whistle for years on the practice field. And you're smiling, and I think you know where I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, keep going, and, keep going, Jerry. Okay, so Betsy, uh, that is the mode of communication. And it's used for one purpose only. My observation after 40 years is when that whistle blows, it's because they're going to point out a mistake. Right. You're doing something wrong. This is not right. And, uh, and now I'm going to correct it for you. So every time the whistle is blown, if you look at the athletes, they're rolling their eyes, they're disgusted with the situation because the coach is actually breaking up play and, and, and knocking, uh, knocking these guys around the field. And, 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 and then they have to stop in the middle of nowhere and wonder why. And then it's, it's like just a correction and a mistake. And so that brings up the whole thing is uh, I started thinking, well, maybe we could use this whistle as a communicative device in a different mm -hmm. way. And this whistle could actually maybe become something that communicates to athletes something other than oh here comes the here here comes the, the put down or here comes the this or that or the negativity or what did i do wrong coach or how did i fail or, or what's going on there so let's have this conversation for a few minutes which is how can the whistle if at all be used in a way that that supports and nurtures everything that you're working with and that john and i are trying to promote as well which is good Absolutely. communication yeah. And I love that you're thinking about that whistle because it's such a tangible <laughs> moment, right? When yeah. the whistle blows. And, and I was smiling because I was thinking I miss the feeling of like winding my whistle around my fingers, you know, just like, <laughs> yeah. and that was really the thing. Like you talk about Both hanging ways. up your whistle. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Backwards Both and ways. forwards, yeah. right? Yeah. And you have your favorite one, like the cords are a little stretchy, but not too much. And it's yeah. the silver whistle, not the plastic one. Right. Yeah. So anyways, um, we could do it on the whistle track <laughs> as long as that track goes. But I think to back up a little bit, Jerry, um, 
the thing that I ask coaches to hold in mind before we really start talking about and getting into the nuances of Gen Z so that we can better understand them is I ask them to hold this idea that it's not impossible, it's simply unpracticed. And that a lot of the judgments that we make about Gen Z student athletes come from the fact that they have not had the opportunity to practice so many of the skills that you and I take for granted. And we have so much to teach each other. As you mentioned, older coaches are well-versed in things like face-to-face -face communication, in connection, where today's student athlete is accustomed to chat-based forms of communication. Many of them struggle or feel very anxious in face-to-face -face situations. So we have so much to teach each other, you know, and the younger generation can teach us how to use all these fantastic apps that we didn't know we needed until we finally have them on our phone, right? But even thinking about that technology gap, most coaches, and I, and I myself was one, you know, there were no cell phones allowed at practice and the coaches had them when we put them on the table. We have in our hands or typically in our back pocket, one of the most powerful tools to connect in real time with today's student athlete. Gen Z student athletes are highly visual communicators and we have cameras on our phone and video features where they're doing a drill and instead of pulling them out or when they sub out saying, hey, remember when you did this, if you could do it like this, instead we can simply hit record film them for five or 10 seconds when they come out and say, I want you to see something really quick. Show them themselves doing it. And I've always loved video as a teaching tool because video doesn't lie and they're seeing themselves and then we make some small adjustments and then they go back out. So can we, instead of banning technology because it was a distraction in the past, can we engage and interface with technology as a way to connect with the future generation of athletes? So back to the whistle piece, Jerry, and I think about, I love this quote by Viktor Frankl, and I may not nail it exactly, but it's something about between stimulus and, res and response, there is a space. In that space lies our ability to choose. And in our choice lies our growth and our freedom. And I love that quote. And that for me is what happens when the whistle blows. There is an opportunity there. Now, depending on who's blowing the whistle, it is always critical. It is always something to fix. It is always a signal that something's gone wrong that something's not right, or it can be a pause. For me, the whistle means stop, and stop sometimes means pause. I'm a big fan of the Socratic method, and so when I blow the whistle, sometimes my first question will be, why did I stop you there? And then we're crowdsourcing answers, or I'm asking more specifically to an individual. You know, it's not, you need to be here instead of here. It's, where could you be if she's going to cut there? And I'm thinking about basketball, but mm -hmm. the whistle can be a pause. And I think that's a great question to throw back to coaches is what does your whistle mean when you blow it? Mm. I think, and, and, go ahead, go ahead John. Oh, I was well, just going to say, I, well, no, you told me, so I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt you now since we're talking about communication. <laughs> um, so it, it's interesting, as you said that Betsy, because I, I don't use a whistle. I coach soccer. I don't use a whistle. I use my voice, but there was a, a time this fall in coaching my kids where um, I, I, I just stopped it and the kids were playing fantastic. And I said, so how's it going? And they defaulted to this, like, we're not working hard. We're not this, we're not that. And uh, I was like, yeah. and, I was like and, telling, and, right? and so I said, wow, I actually thought you guys were great, but that I said, but that tells me that I, I pretty much only stop it when it's not going well, don't I? And they're like, yeah, coach, kind of. And I'm like, wow, what a great learning moment for me. Like I got to do a few moment. extra stoppages in, in the good. And um, yeah. it's, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty funny of like, and I love your just question of why did I stop? Right. And, and now, and, and really, cause it's amazing. Kids are, it's, it's browbeaten into them to default to like, if I shout out communication, hard work and focus, I'm probably going to like the coaches will go, yes, that's it. Right. Um, <laughs> but there's no thinking involved. They've just spent 15 years throwing out those words or having those words thrown at them. Um, and that's not communication, right? That's just, the, there's no thought for them. There's no thought right. for you as the coach. There's no depth to that at, at all. So what are, what are some of the keys? Like, what are, what are the things would, that you would say to a coach, you're coming to work with me and, and say, um, all right, what, what are the keys to great communication for a, a coach? And it's, it's interesting that we're capping off 2020 with this, because this has been a big part of my growth, personal growth this year, 
is studying communication. And even on this podcast, we had Stephen Rolnick, who was one of the founders of motivational interviewing to have these good conversations with kids and Nick Winkleman, who's one of the experts in skill acquisition and queuing. And so I think having you sort of sum this up of like, yeah, well, well, What's my, what's John O'Sullivan's 12 step program here? I need one. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and this, I'll say, John, this is part of what I love about communication and also why I'm very intentional about calling myself a communication specialist. Sometimes if I'm, you know, being introduced, whether it's a podcast or a presentation, people mistakenly say the communication expert. And I'm very intentional about calling myself a specialist because I think it would be very egotistical and also naive for me to say, I, Betsy, know all things related to communication and I'm here to impart my wisdom among the masses. What I love about communication is there is no ceiling. There's no point at which I'm going to know everything there is to know about communication, but also specifically what's going to benefit a group. So if I was coming in to work with you and your team, John, the very first thing I would do was spend intentional time observing. And when I go to work with a college program, it's typically over two days and I'll observe all forms of training and interaction. So whether that's a staff meeting pre-practice to an actual practice or training session, to the weight room, to a team meeting, and all I'm doing is taking notes and they're curious questions. So without judgment, being able to observe what's happening in real time so that I get a feel for what is the language of this program because there's no one right way to do it. Oftentimes some of the things you'll hear from the bench or from coaches is we need to talk out there It's like, great, what are we saying? And why are we saying it? And why does it matter? Because talking alone isn't enough to achieve the goals that we have. Talking is noise unless we're intentional about what we're saying. And how can we say things in such a way that adds value in the moment to the goals of the individual and the team? Hmm. After that observational period, I'll then typically meet with the staff and we'll go over the notes. And this, I mean, this has been anywhere from like a one to a, I think it was a four and a half hour dinner at one point where we're just reviewing everything. And I'll I'll say, Jerry, I noticed you said this in practice when you had stopped this individual. Tell me more about what your goal was there. And then we'll look at the language. Same thing, John, when you brought the team together, you said this, I'm curious if you said this, it might more accurately, you know, hit upon the message you were trying to deliver. Sometimes it's small changes in words. Sometimes it's, um, you know, tell me more about that individual athlete and how they like to learn. So one of my favorite things about being a coach was the one-on-one coaching, you know, that typically happened in the off season. I love the challenge of if you're teaching shooting, for example, you know, there's the acronym beef, balance, eyes, elbow, follow through. Well, what if the kid's a vegetarian and they don't even want to hear the word beef, right? So it's like, how do you teach something in a completely different way? And that challenge, and that's, I think, the ask for us as educators is how flexible, how versatile can we be in teaching something, not the way that we understand it, but in a way that connects with the understanding of the individual in front of us. And I love that quote, um, a great teacher, I think it's something like a great teacher shows you where to look, but not what to see. And that's like the constant invitation. Can we play on that edge of, Mm -hmm. I'm not here to tell you what to do because it's how I did it. Mm. I'm here to look at what you do and offer suggestions on how you might improve it based on what's most important to you. So Mm. it looks different for every group that I work with. Are there some common themes that, you know, are best practices? Sure. And everybody's different. And that's what's continually exciting and stimulating about this work. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I, I love, uh, if I could just jump in here, John, Yeah. I, I love this. Uh, I don't want to overlook this idea that you brought up about the expert's mind, because so many people, A, feel pressure to be an expert, were put in that role. And for me, it's very uncomfortable. I don't like it. Uh, people always look to me for the answers to their life and to their questions. But what happens is if I give them answers, then I become very responsible for the outcome of their lives. And I don't want that. And right. so I love what you bring up there with the expert. I remember the uh, quote, and I don't know if I got this one correct, but uh, it's, uh, it's in a wonderful book, one of my favorites, uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, Suzuki. And uh, in that book, he says, in the, in, the, in the beginner's mind, there are many options. Mm. In the expert's mind, there are but a few. Mm. And, yeah. and that really plays to your point. And I think what happens, a lot of coaches feel they have to have answers and they have to have 
reasons for this or that. And, and maybe the answer is just maybe asking a question. So how, how would I be a better coach for you? Or how, how could you be a, the better athlete that you want to be? And uh, maybe we'll learn something from that. Uh, right. The other point I, I just, <laughs> this is just one of my things with the whistle. Can I go back to the whistle for a yeah, minute? Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. <You> know? <laughs> Tweet, time so, out. Take so, uh, Jerry, go for it. Right, okay, here we go. Back to the whistle. What an opportunity to use it as a tool for something really positive. So what I like to do, and John and I both agree with this, is use the whistle as a way to catch somebody doing something right. Absolutely. And try that in a practice. In fact, run a whole practice that way and let all the mistakes go. Mm -hmm. The end of the world isn't going to happen. And then what you do, you start integrating it so the kids don't know and they're not thinking the whistle is negative or the, ne or the whistle is positive. What they do is it's an opportunity for a coach to teach the values of connection and love and, and selflessness. You know, you just see a wonderful play that an athlete did out on the field and, and they were being totally selfish, selfless. You blow the whistle, bring the team in, get into a circle, hutter around. Did you see what Betsy just did there? Who mm -hmm. saw that? You did? Jane, what do you think about that? Who else thinks they can do that? Okay, guys, let's go out in the field now and let's try to all be selfless and see what that looks like. So it becomes this fun opportunity to learn and to, to catch somebody doing something right, right instead of catching them to do something wrong. But yeah. um, anyway. Yeah, yeah Sue, I mean, and I th you say that, Jerry, and I think of Sue Inquist. So Sue has become a, a friend and mentor of mine over the years. And mm -hmm. and <laughs> she joked, she's like, why weren't you around when I was coaching? You know, I would have mm -hmm. been such a better coach. And, mm -hmm. and I love hearing Sue tell these stories of when she was not her best and, and what <laughs> she's learned about herself over the years. And you're talking about someone, I think, who won 10 national championships coaching softball at UCLA. So it's like, what a what a wealth of wisdom we get from the ability to look back and to self-reflect and, and to gain that self-awareness over time. And she said, one of the things she said from day one was, you know, can we catch them doing it right? Because there is so much pressure to improve and, and we can't have, you know, mistakes and we need to be perfect. And it's like, gosh, are we balancing that or yeah. not? Because your student athletes feel that. And if you want the best out of people, we have to give them our best first. We can't just expect, 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 and take, take, take. What are you investing? What are you pouring into so that you stand the best chance of having something great come out? Great. Well, good I, think as, I, I think as well, the challenge that we face, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of our coaches listening now is that, again, none of this that we're talking about, being a listener, right, asking questions, understanding the kids in front of us, None of this doesn't, you know, means that you can't be demanding, right? Yep. None of this doesn't mean that you can't be competitive. You know, you, you, you can go for that national championship, that state championship. But I think what we, we've always tried to get across on this podcast and we're talking about here is if you get the most out of everyone on your roster, you have your best chance of winning. But if you are more worried about my way, um, and, 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 and so maybe what I I'm trying to ask you is how do we balance, uh, the thing of, I am the coach, this is my livelihood, this is right. my program. And you are, you are here to be more like us in our culture, right. With connecting with that individual and trying to understand her, or trying to understand him so that I can potentially get the most out of them. And, and then where do I draw the line between, you know what, you can still be a part of this, or maybe this is just not a good fit because not everyone's mm -hmm. going to be a good fit. Right. And there's so many things in what you just said, John, and I'll start with this idea of, and I'll say this to coaches, especially when I do the Gen Z presentation, because the pushback I often get, and rightly so, is it sounds like you're asking us to be soft on today's mm -hmm. student athlete. Like we should just give up everything we stand for and, and mm -hmm. pander to and cater to today's student athlete. You that you phrase yeah. it much better than I did, but that's exactly you know, what I mean. <laughs> it's, and it's a, it's a real thing, right? So, and the point I always strive to make, and I with different iterations of that presentation, I'm more accurately addressing that in real time. The thing that I like to tell coaches is there's one of you, if you're the head coach, let's say, there's you know 18 to 25 of them. It is a lot easier for you as one individual to shift or change than it is to try to change 25 other people. So the ask is not can we give up our principles and values in service of 
what this generation likes. And whenever I'm working with a team or an individual, I really try to stay away from what do you like and don't like and focus on what's effective or mm -hmm. not as effective because the like can change, you know, with the weather. So really focusing on behavior and is what you're doing the most effective way to get the result that you're looking for. If it's not, well, then maybe let's try other things. And then I'm going to ask, what have you tried? And what have you found to be successful? What do you know definitely doesn't work? So that we're not, I'm not asking someone to try to do things that they've already done in some way. So with the resistance of, you know, but I am the coach and, and it is my way. Yes. And with coaches, I always talk about, you know, what are your negotiables and your non-negotiables? So even with this idea that today's student athlete loves to co-create, when I say the phrase, you know, the challenge for us as coaches is can we help co-create the sport experience for our student athletes. You've got certain coaches that are like, but it's not their job. They don't get a say. I'm the coach. It's my program. Yes. And your program is made up of your student athletes. Mm -hmm. It behooves us to work with them versus against them. So what are your non-negotiables where you are going to be this or do this or say this in this way, because it's who you are and what you value. And what can we give over to our student athletes or invite them into the space where they get to have some voice in co-creating. When we co-create, we immediately increase the accountability and ownership in our program. We want to have student athletes that are invested and bought in. Mm -hmm. Let's co-create with them mm -hmm. because they're used to customizing every other element of their world mm -hmm. because of technology. So can we afford them some small opportunities, whether it's where we eat on the road? You as a coaching staff, we've got these three options. You guys choose because any of them are fine with me, but in giving that choice over to my student athletes, now I've involved them and I've said your voice matters. So yeah, in what yeah. ways are we being intentional about making sure each voice has value within our program? And for me, that always comes back to, are our student athletes seen, valued, and appreciated? Mm -hmm. Because if you only focus on those three things, regardless of sport, when you have an entire group of people that feel seen, valued, and appreciated, that group will give you their best. And when you have a whole group that's giving yeah. you their best, well, you tend to win a lot of games. Mm -hmm. So John, uh, th this might be a good good place just to throw in the river right here, right? So John and I talk about these athletes to your point about in, what's important, valued, and, and you're empowering people when you give them the choice, right? Right. So we have an acronym and it's uh, called the river. And what I like to do is I like to think of bathing, marinating all these athletes in the river. And the river stands for respected. Uh, well, I should start off by saying relevant. Uh, I is important, V is valued, E is empowered, and R is respected. When athletes feel those five or any one of those five, they're going to go the distance. Right. They're going to be mentally tough. As a psychologist, I don't have to teach mental toughness. Mental toughness comes from a place of feeling empowered, from feeling valued and important. And so yes. the river effect is that which we can just keep in the uh, front of our minds, we walk into a group and we say, you know what, I'm going to look for ways that I can baronate these guys and, 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 and these students and these athletes in, in the river. And, yeah. uh, you know, like, like give them the choice. How do you empower people? Give them a choice, have them have a say in the way things go, you know, yes. like with my kids when, when they were younger, uh, you know, they were very young and, 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 you know, my wife, Jan, and I would want them to get to bed by, say, I don't know, 730, right? And we give them choices. You can go to bed right now and we could read you a story or you could play with your trucks and your toys and your dolls and then you can get in bed on your own at 730 or you can go and have a snack in the kitchen and then come and I'll read you a story and then get to bed by 730. Well, they're all getting to bed by 730, but the thing that yep. they're learning <laughs> is they all had a choice and a say. You know? right. So, right. so this is uh, – you know, the river thing is, is, is something that keeps me focused on uh, on how I want to be with people, how I want to connect with people, how I want to show how I care about people. So, yeah. yeah. And I love the analogy to children. It's amazing. So um, my wife and I are expecting a daughter, our first in I February. Know. I so know. Yeah. In this journey to become a new parent, it's like there's so I just did, um, gosh, the Breakthrough Summit the Digital Leadership Summit for Women in Sport that's co-created by We Coach and Huddle was on Monday this past week. And I did a presentation on how difficult conversations are a lot like babies because you know my world has been inundated really with these two things, especially the past seven and a half months. And there's so many different parallels. So 
after you bring up children and and i love that example it's like do you want to eat your broccoli before your chicken or after your chicken you're still eating your broccoli but when we give people choices especially especially in the pandemic landscape that we're facing where so many of our choices feel like they've been taken away from us Mm -hmm. can we reacclimate and reintroduce choice into our conversations even Mm -hmm. professionally right when i'm sending an email or we're looking to connect with someone would you prefer to connect by phone or over zoom small choices any small choice lets someone feel like they have a say and they automatically become as you said jerry more empowered more invested Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think i and and i like how when you talk about non-negotiables, right? These are, I like to think of them as the bumpers, right? These are the we we the bumpers on the bowling alley for the little kids, right? That like I it, it keeps lot, you in play, so. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, you know, but that keeps it in play. So as long as it fits between the bumpers, it's okay. So those are my non-negotiables. Hmm. And then where can I give ownership? Where can I give autonomy within the bumpers of my program? And and I think kind of to tie it together, you know, a lot of the top professional clubs now and stuff, I mean, we had an MLS head coach on the podcast uh, a while back and he talked about like, you know, he, he would grab one of his players and say, you know, here's 10 video clips of what we're going, you know, we really need to work on. I want you to pick three and you talk to the team about them. Mm-hmm. Right. And now that player has ownership over teaching this thing and the coaches can chime in and they can give little bits and pieces, but now we're merging this thing of like, Hey, they get technology and you can't argue with the video. Right. Right. So it's, it's, you know, like the video is pretty clear of what just happened there. You can't argue with that. And so how can we, um, how can we, you know, give them those things to own within our bumpers so that we can, you know, it's your team and it's my team. But really, we're the best when it's our team. Right. And I, I mean, that our piece, really, like I think about the difference in language between you, I, and we. And when I listen to coaches talk, when I listen to student athletes talk, turn on any sports event and then listen to the pregame talk, the postgame interview, and listen for those specifically and how they're used among the best athletes and among the best teams. I think about, you know, you talk about options and oftentimes if I'm, so I'll say I usually meet people at, at either end of the spectrum. So there's the individual coaches, if we're talking about doing executive coaching, where an athletic director or administrator is called and said, hey, can you work with this person before we need to let them go, right? So they're stepping into a situation where they're being told they need to work with me versus teams or individuals on the other end of the spectrum that said, hey, we're really good and we know that communication is that competitive edge that we can find that 1% and you know outpace our competition. Where I'll say on the, that first end of the spectrum, the resistance that I find with coaching some individuals is they say, well, I don't want you to come in and change me. And that's never the goal. My mm. goal is always, I don't wanna change you. I wanna give you as many options as possible so that you have more choices to make. And you can Brilliant. choose whatever best suits you yeah. in the context that you find yourself in. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that, that whole thing is, it's just self-awareness. I mean, people ask me all the time, what's the most important, you know, what, what's coaching 101? And I think self-awareness is 101. And, and sadly, in most coaching education, we skip over that and we say, well, you know, here's your practice plan, all. right? Here's your three, <laughs> yeah. two zone. Here's your this, here's your that. And we never look at ourselves. We never look at our why. We never look at what are our default behaviors that aren't necessarily helpful to helping our athletes and our teams get better. And um, this is this is huge. I, I wanted to ask you um, one of the things you kind of just touched on it, but as a coach, we all have difficult conversations. And yes. whether it's about someone who is not – buying into the culture of the team, not fitting, you know, not treating teammates well. And I think a lot of our listeners are youth coaches. Some, some of these difficult conversations are with parents as well. Mm -hmm. So what, what is your advice for navigating these really difficult conversations? I mean, how many hours do you have? (laughs) Because there's, there's so many, there's so much to unpack here when it comes to difficult conversations. And the way I like to start when I do the, the confrontation for connection workshop is depending on the size of the group, 
I'll either do this where they do a reflective exercise and then they tell me and I'll write it on a, a whiteboard virtually because that's how we're doing it now. Or I'll use a tool like Mentimeter and I'll ask them to input their answers and we'll create this big word cloud, right? So I'll say, what words come to mind when you hear the word conflict? And what words come to mind when you hear the word confrontation? And typically what comes up, let's say we've got a group of 20 people. We're gonna end up with close to 80, 90 words on the screen. Once we've completed that exercise, I'll go back and say, okay, I'd like you to point out which ones are inherently positive. And typically they'll only find seven, eight, maybe nine that are inherently positive. And that's the whole point is that when we think about difficult conversations, even the name, right? Difficult conversations. We think about conflict, we think about confrontation. The starting point for me is we need to change the way that we think about these things. And there's an exercise that I love to do, the spiral down exercise, where the whole point is when we change our perspective, we can have an entirely different experience. So when it comes to navigating difficult conversations, engaging in difficult conversations, the starting point is changing how we think about them so we give ourselves the chance to have a different experience while we're holding them. Most folks tend to avoid difficult conversations because they've had a negative experience in the past or they've never been taught how to do them well in a way that creates greater trust and relationship, that increases respect instead of creating a greater distance or divide between people. So for me, that's the starting point. Where it goes from there, there's so many fascinating and fantastic resources, whether it's you know crucial conversations or fierce conversations, the tools inherent in some of these books that have been well-researched and applied over time are wonderful. And same thing, the more we learn, the more we practice, the more options we have in the moment for how can I respond? And that's really why I love improv as a general practice. Typically I'll ask a group, you know, how many of you have ever done an improv exercise or done improv before? And I said, for those of you that are shaking your head and like, oh no, Betsy, I'd never do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely do it. Because I used to joke with our teams and I tell them, you know, improv will save your life. And the truth in that statement is if we can learn to respond to what's needed right now with whatever is immediately available to us, we're probably going to be okay in most situations in life. And it's a, it's, it's a practice. It's a skill set. And we can do the same thing with language, right? The more we learn, but we only learn if we show up. So the more we avoid these difficult conversations, and I, I'll say, I don't have one on me right now. And I know this is a podcast, so it's not visual. But if you picture, I love that story about there was a uh, professor on the first day of class, psychology class. So she's standing at the front. She has a glass of water. It's half full. Everyone thought she's going to ask the classic is a glass half full, half empty question. Instead, she said, how much does this glass of water weigh? And she fielded a few guesses from the people in the room, five ounces, eight ounces. Eventually, she said, it doesn't matter how much it weighs. What matters is how long I hold it. So if I hold it for a few seconds, nothing's going to happen. If I try to hold it for about an hour. I won't be able to hold it as high. I might get some tingling numbness in my arms. If I try to hold it all day. I'm going to likely drop the glass and I'll be in so much pain, I'll lose the functionality of my arm. Same thing with difficult conversations. The longer we hold on to things, the more incapacitating they become. So the invitation that I offer individuals is at every point, put the glass down. Now, what are you holding on to? What are you avoiding that in doing so is actually causing more harm either to yourself or more specifically to the relationship? but we need to have the skills in order to be able to feel like we can put that glass down or else we're just going to drop it. And we're going to break something. Jerry question. Brilliant. I'm uh, what I'm doing here is uh, I'm asking myself the question, what can I learn here? <laughs> and, I ask it all the time. Jerry. And, 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 I, and I'm freaking like, I'm listening. Like you can't believe and, and uh, taking it all in and writing it down. And I have a whole three page of notes here. So uh, this has been amazing for me. Uh, and, and, you know, my, my background is psychology. So, uh, you know, I'm naturally attracted to what you're saying naturally. But I also, because of the work that John and I do, I really see the value in your work so much so, uh, you know, I, I want to have it, you know, I want to have that reflected in the work that we're doing. And uh, we're, we're doing a lot of it, but uh, your, your way of expressing it to me uh, is amazing. And uh, you just got this uh, uh, genuine, authentic, vulnerable, what else do I want to say? Well, that's enough. That's, that's good coaching right there. And, Thank uh, you, Jerry. 
Yeah, I'm. I'm really. Uh, John, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Or um, I at the end here, uh, Betsy. I know I want to give you an opportunity to tell people your website and social media and how to connect with you. And I know you have a, a gift for our listeners, but I just wanted to give you the uh, the uh, maybe why don't you give them that, and then I want to give you the chance to have the final word here. What what's your parting thought for the group? But how how can people connect with you? You can connect with me on my website www.betsybutterick.com. You can connect with me on Twitter at Betsy Butterick or on Instagram at Betsy underscore the coach's coach. And the gift that I have that you mentioned, so I have a digital course, it's called Winning with Words, Championship Communication for Coaches. It's 112 videos, over three and a half hours of content. It's all direct to camera, so there's no slides. It comes with worksheets and ways that you can take what I present in the course and then apply it to your own team. Typically, the classic course retails at $297. The gift I'd like to give the listeners today is I have a promo code, and that promo code is W-O-C-P-O-D. Uh, we, you just broke up if there. You go to the website and you click on the classic. Hold, hold course, on one second. Enter that code. Oh, uh, it, it I'm just sorry. You, it just paused out. It just cut out during the code. You don't know how many okay. emails I would have got for that one. So <laughs> let's just say it, I think you said W O C P O D, and that's the last yep. we heard. That's the code. So W O C P O D, which is Way of Champions podcast. So W O C P O D. If cool. you purchase the classic course which is listed at 297s and you enter that code, it's going to take $200 off Oof. and you can have the course for $97. You get a year of access from the time you first sign on. And I'm committed to doing this, especially in this time, because I know with COVID, one of the first budgets to get cut is personal and professional development. Mm. And communication is so essential, especially at this time. So if I can help coaches at the high school and college level specifically improve their communication, so that we can better support those that we seek to serve during this time, I'm happy to do so. Well, I, I heard a comment uh, actually recently, it's kind of timely. It has said, you know, the reason for all the war in the world is lack of communication. And I think so, sometimes a lot of coaches out there were fighting wars and the battlefield is, is, the, is the pitch or the basketball court. And uh, these, kind of, these kind of tidbits, these, these little nuggets that you're that you're extending to us uh, really uh, are a way to communicate which will uh, prevent the the occurrence of such battles and wars that we don't need to get into mm -hmm. yeah there's a quote Jerry you're making me think um, and I'll give two more resources and then I'll do the quote so that the resources you mentioned the act videos Jerry and anybody mm -hmm. can go on YouTube there's 35 active communication technique videos I encourage you to use them for yourself they're great to send to your team because they're short, so they're gonna watch them and you can start applying them right away. The other thing is if you go to my website at the bottom, there's gonna be a button for free resources and links. There's a ton of webinars, podcasts, and panels that I've been on specifically since COVID started. These are all free resources that are available for you to download and use. Please watch them. Uh, if anything benefits you, take it, run with it. My goal whenever I speak and present is how quickly can I teach and transfer? So how can I take what I've learned or what I've found valuable and hand it over to others so that they feel like it's now theirs and they don't need me anymore. So if you find value in any of those, please take it and use it for your benefit. The quote you made me think of, Jerry, is, and there's a wonderful book, it's called um, Collaborating with the Enemy, how mm -hmm. to engage with people you don't like trust or agree with i think it's some version of that title and there's a quote in there about how um it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble it's what you know for sure that just ain't so and i think about that all the time like the way that miscommunication keeps us from connection keeps us from our greatest successes and the fact that communication is a skill and can we be more mm -hmm. intentional about our communication mm -hmm. than before you listen to this podcast. That's my only ask for anyone that's still listening yeah. is, can we be a little more intentional about our communication, knowing that in doing so, we stand to improve all areas of our lives? Yeah. Well, without communication, I've been together with my partner for 45 years. Without communication, we would have never made it. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yep. It doesn't matter what kind of person you are. If we can't talk with each other, if we can't yeah. listen to each other, yeah. we stand yeah. a really hard time. And that goes with John and I too, you know, the fact that uh, 
I can communicate with this guy, you know, and he can communicate with me and be honest and trustful and respectful. Uh, that's how things get built. That's yeah. how cultures get made. And so yeah. you're doing a very important uh, uh, piece of work in this life and uh, not to minimize that. I know in the beginning it was almost, I know you weren't purposely doing this, but it almost sounded like you were apologizing in a way for not having uh, a, a great mind blowing uh, big explosion type of thing going on here. You know, it's the little things that matter. And uh, from little streams come big rivers, as they say. And uh, communication is like probably the top, one of the top two or three items on, on the list for great coaching and coaches that are most effective are all good communicators when we look at them, yeah. Thank you, well, I'll, I'll sign off here for all of us with a quote since everyone else is dropping quotes, which I believe is. Yeah, you're, hard you're under pressure. You have to have, <laughs> right? If you don't have a quote, I'm going to be very disappointed. The, the greatest problem with communication is the illusion it has taken place, right? And that's uh, <laughs> Bernard Shaw, I believe. And I think uh, if, you, if you watch my favorite videos, author, if you, if you, Jerry was yeah. an English teacher, by the way. Yeah, you know, I love G.B. Shaw. Yeah. And if you. G.B. Shaw. If, if you take GB all these show. things and uh, yeah. you take some of these great techniques and took some good notes today, uh, communication will take place. So uh, Betsy, on behalf of Jerry and I and all the Way of Champions family, thank you so, so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, thank Betsy. You it's, it's wonderful. Fantastic.